Okay, so we were looking at the assignment problem, right? Special case of uh, discrete optimal transport, and we wrote down at the end of class this <coughs> auction algorithm. Uh, so now I want to try to analyze it a little bit and see if it actually does what we want it to do. So remember there was this bidding phase and this assignment phase. Uh, and there's two things that we need to check. One, we need to check that at the end of each iteration we preserve uh, this epsilon complementary slackness condition. <coughs> and two, we need to show that at some point we'll have a complete assignment that everybody has been has, holds the winning bid on some object. And if we can do those two things, now we're holding in our hands a complete assignment that satisfies epsilon complementary slackness. And that meant we saw that we can get within uh, epsilon n of the optimal value for the original assignment problem. Uh, or if epsilon is small enough, we might actually solve it exactly. OK, so those are the two things that we want to show. <coughs> so first, we need to show this property is preserved. Uh, preserved. OK, so we do an iteration. This changes the price vector. Right? Everything that gets bid on, its price goes up. So at the end of the iteration, the price vector has increased. Uh, and we're going to give these things names. So it started out, everything was price P. And it became P tilde, let's say. And we know that the prices are not going to go down. They could stay the same, because it's possible that in a round of bidding, some object will not get bid on by anybody. <coughs> OK, so now we need to look at all the pairs that are in our assignment at the end of, of this round of bidding and assignment, and try to show that this property still holds. OK, so let's consider any i and j star that are in the assignment at the end of this round. It's at the end of the iteration. It's at the end of this round of the auction. This pen might be on its way out. OK, there's two possibilities. Um, either in this last round of the auction, person I bid on this object and had the winning bid, and this got added to the assignment. Or it's possible that in this round of bidding, actually nobody bid on object J star. This was just already in here from a previous round of bidding. So those two cases to consider. So case one is that I J star was just added to S. in this round. <clears throat> OK, so what's the quantities that we need to look at? We need to look at AIJ star minus PJ star under our, our new updated pricing scheme. And we want to show that we can get within epsilon of the maximum value of this quantity over all the j's. <coughs> OK, so remember, the new price was simply the high bid, right? It was whatever person I actually bid on this object. So this was nothing but aij star minus bij star. And we wrote down exactly what that bid was last time. We wrote it down in a couple uh, equivalent forms. Uh, so one of the expressions we had for the winning bid, or for a bid in general, was hey, the benefit, remember, compared to the next best uh, object. And then with a little plus epsilon to make sure that prices were going up. OK, so the A's cancel. 
Remember, this was the next best object. So it was a maximum not over all j, but over almost all of the j's, everything except j star. So this was the max j not equal to j star of aij minus pj. Okay, this is p, not p tilde. This was the old prices that we used to calculate the bid minus epsilon. Right, the old price is less than the new price. It's actually going to be strictly less than uh, in this case because something got bid on. So this is less than the uh, new price. So this is a greater than or equal to, and I can put the new price in here. Right, which is almost what I want. Right? I wanted to show that this is greater than or equal to this if I have the maximum over all j here. Now, I've checked that it's greater than or equal to this quantity for every j except 1, except j star. Uh, and j star we can check directly. So if I try to check j star, well, this is going to trivially hold. Right? So this is greater than or equal to this for all j is not equal to j star. It's greater than or equal to this when j is equal to j star. So indeed, we get the result that we want. That this is going to get within epsilon of the maximum over all j. Okay, so that is what happens if uh, J star was bid on in this round. And the other possibility is that actually J star wasn't bid on. So I J star uh, wasn't added to S in this round. But it is in S, right? It's, it's in S. We started, we only have to check things that are in S. Uh, so it got put there earlier. Um, so what can I say about, about the new price in this case? What is pj tilde equal to? It's equal to pj, exactly. So no, in this round, nobody bid on this object, so the price hasn't gone up. It's equal to whatever it was at the beginning of this step. So pj star tilde is equal to pj star. OK, and we know at the end of the last round, we have epsilon complementary slackness, right? We just need to show that each round preserves it. It was true of the initial, of the initial thing trivially. OK, so since, uh, since we had this property at the begin after the last step, I can write down this. So AIJ star minus PJ star tilde, which is exactly the same as PJ star, <coughs> got within epsilon of the max last time. OK, now this is the max over all j. So these aren't necessarily equal to p tilde, right? Um, but they're always greater than or equal to p tilde, uh, less than or equal to p tilde, right? The prices always go up. 
So just like I did before, I can relate this to what happens with my new prices. <clears throat> right, and that's what we wanted. Uh, regardless of whether this object was bid on or not in this round, we have this property uh, at the end of each round. It's preserved by the algorithm. Happy with that part? OK, then the other question that we had was, does this algorithm terminate? Okay, if there's a complete assignment, it terminates, because the only people who bid are people who don't currently have a high bid. <coughs> so I'll make a couple observations, I guess. Once an, once an object, so once some value of j is in the assignment, it's always in the assignment, right? Once an object has been bid on, it's been bid on. You know, the per, who holds the high bid on it could change, but that object has always been bid on. So once object j is assi has been assigned once, it's always assigned. Uh, and in particular, the cardinality of S of this assignment is going to be non-decreasing, right? Because once a value of J is in, it's always in. Could be, we'll add objects that also are getting bid on. But once an object's been bid on, we never take it back up. So certainly, certainly this set is not going to shrink on us. <clears throat> and we know that uh, there's, a, there's a minimum amount that the bid can go up each time, right? It always goes up by at least epsilon. So each time an object is bid on, its price goes up. Its price goes up by at least epsilon. So let's keep those facts in the back of our mind and try to show that this algorithm actually does terminate. So I'm going to do it by contradiction. Let's suppose that this algorithm keeps running forever and it never finds a complete assignment. And we'll see what happens. So let's suppose oh, S is never a complete assignment. So that means there's some poor object that just nobody wants. They really don't want it, and they've never bid on it, and they're never going to bid on it. It's not assigned. It's never going to be assigned. Yes? Because if it had been assigned, it would have to stay assigned. It can't get unassigned. So there exists some j uh, that is never assigned. Uh, so what's the price of object J? Stays at which? It never goes up, yeah. So it's going to be zero. Nobody ever bid on it. So PJ equals zero. <coughs> OK, I'm going to define this number 
Uh, and as we've seen in other examples, this number is going to just pop up organically on its own. So the first time I ran through this proof, I didn't def make this definition at this step. I figured out what I wanted it to be later on. Um, but it's going to be the maximal possible distance uh, between, between these different uh, values. Uh, and the maximum is well defined, right? Because this is a this is a discrete uh, set. There's a discrete number of them. <coughs> now the the auction never terminates. There's infinitely many bids, um, which could be it could be that these are split among all the other all the different objects that they all keep getting lots of bids. Uh, maybe it's just there's one really popular object that everybody keeps bidding on. But, but at least one object is going to be bid on arbitrarily many times, right? Maybe, maybe multiple objects, but at least one. OK, so there exists an object K. That is bid on basically infinitely many times, as, as many as you want. Okay. And every time it gets bid on, its price goes up by at least epsilon. Right? So its price is also going up through the roof. Okay, so at some point, object K has been bid on at least at least say A over epsilon times, or maybe more. And since this gets bid on infinitely many times, it's been bid on this many times. And at some later round of the auction, somebody's going to bid on it again. So in the current round, okay, someone bids on object A again. OK, so we can deduce a couple of things from this. One, the price has gone up a lot on this particular object, right? Because each time it goes up epsilon, so the current price is now at least A. So before, before this next round of the auction, the current price, Dk, is going to be bigger than A. OK, and if somebody is bidding on it again, that means somebody wants it. So if person I wants it, that means that this object is the most valuable object to them. Right? That's how they decide what to bid on. They say, I look at the value of all the objects to me based on the current pricing scheme, and I pick which one is, is the most valuable. And for somebody out there, object K is the most valuable, maybe for multiple people. <coughs> now, uh, what we're going to try to show is that this becomes ridiculous at some point, that the value of this, you know, with the price going up arbitrarily high, at some point, this can't be right. At some point, object J over here is so cheap, the person I really should choose this over that astronomically priced thing. Okay, so let's compare the value of these things. Okay, so what do we know? We know if we compare the value of these things, um, let me write it like this. So if we look at VIK minus uh, VIJ. How much person I wants object K versus how much they want object J. 
this was AIK minus PK. So value minus price and value minus price. Uh, with this price being nothing. <clears throat> okay, so let me rearrange this a little bit. I have AIK minus AIJ minus PK. Um, now, what do we know? We know the PK, the price of this, is bigger than A. Right? So the price of this is going to be less than or minus A here. And we can also bound this difference, right? This is a discrete number of different values of I's and K's and J's. So there's definitely a maximum on this. And we called the maximum A. Again, it was at this step of the proof where I actually decided how to define A in real life. So I can also say this is less than or equal to A. In other words, if person I looks at object K, the benefit of object K to him is less than the benefit of object J to him. And that means, actually, object K shouldn't be, sh he shouldn't be bidding on this in object in this round, right? We started by assuming somebody bids on it. Uh, but actually, that doesn't make sense. He, he, no, nobody would choose to bid on this object because you know, regardless of what everything else is doing, certainly object J is more valuable. So this means that actually no one does bid on object K. Right? In other words, it, it contradicts this observation here that VIK was a maximum. It's not a maximum. Okay, and that's our contradiction. We started by assuming the algorithm never terminates, and we ended up saying, actually, that doesn't work, because eventually the price of some objects is going to get way too high. Nobody will want them anymore. They're going to go for the, for the cheap things instead. So this is our contradiction. And we can say the algorithm terminates in a complete assignment. <coughs> Any questions on that proof? It's, I mean, it's kind of a nice algorithm and proof in that it's extremely intuitive. Um, what else? It's highly parallelizable, right? You know, we have all our different people. At each round of the auction, everybody has to decide what they want to bid on. And they don't care what everybody else has bid on. They're just, they're just looking at what they want to bid on, right? So, so that, that can all be done in parallel, certainly. And similarly, in the assignment phase, um, we have to look at all the objects and decide who holds the high bid on them. Um, it doesn't matter who holds the high bid on the other objects. This can all be done in parallel. Uh, so this is certainly parallelizable. Right, and you can you, know, you can specify your error bound ahead of time and know that you get within your error bound um, in terms of the, how close you get to the optimal cost. Okay, so we have error bounds. <clears throat> okay, and you can actually add up the worst case to cost. Uh, so if we know that each object gets bid on um, 
at most A over epsilon time. Lots of wiggle wheel and that ridiculous things start to happen. So each object, if each object receives at most A over epsilon bids, And if the total cost uh, of bidding on an object is order n, if there are potentially n people who might bid on this object, okay, and there's n objects to consider. What does that mean? That the worst case cost is going to be order n times n times a over epsilon. That's worst case. Of course, the, ob the algorithm might terminate much earlier than this. Uh, but it's not going to terminate later than this. Uh, and again, you can sort of split this up so that the per processor cost might be more like a n over epsilon, for example. So you can at least balance what's going on. And there's tricks you can uh, do to, to accelerate this uh, to improve the worst case cost or to improve the type of cost that, you know, there's a difference between worst case cost and the type of cost that you kind of almost always see in practice, but you can't necessarily prove why that's the case. So um, there's tricks you can do. Uh, to speed this up. Uh, but that is the auction algorithm. It's one of, one of the early methods for doing at least the subcase of discrete optimal transport. <coughs> Any questions on that? Okay, so what about more general problems that are that are non-assignment problems? Uh, the more general problems are much more, from the numerical standpoint, are a much more recent uh, topic of, of interest. Uh, so I want to at least outline a little bit a method that was proposed actually a few years ago by two different people at the same time independently, at basically at exactly the same time. Uh, so. Uh, so I want to at least summarize that a little bit. So more general problems. <clears throat> uh, so it was one key observation that kind of makes this work. So here it just just to remind you, this is the problem, which we've written down a whole bunch of times already. So we sum the costs against this transport plan, subject to getting the correct marginals. Okay, and we certainly want pi to be Okay, and we know this is a huge linear program that sounds simple in principle, but it's not something that you want to actually deal with in practice computationally. <coughs> <coughs> in particular, we have uh, m times n unknowns. Uh, and these are the pi's that we're trying to solve for, these components of this uh, transport plan. Okay, and what values is pi allowed to take? What, what will it take in the end? What's the lowest value it will take? Zero, that's written right there. What's the highest value it will take? So in this, in this discrete problem, I guess, 
1, yeah. So we know pi lives between 0 and 1. So pi j takes on values between 0 and 1. So here's my question. What is the most common value that we're going to see here? Could you guess at that or estimate it? You went to Ethan 0.5. Any other, any other people want to hazard a guess? We solve this transport plan. We look at all the different m times n values of pi. What's likely to be the most common value? Zero. You think zero. Why do you think zero? Because you think we'll be unlucky to have, have them all being zeros. OK, so I'm not sure about your reasoning here, um, but your answer is correct. Uh, let me do a really uh, simple toy example and try to convince it, maybe give you a little more intuition into why we should expect a lot of zeros here. We, yeah, in some sense, we want to do the minimum amount of transport, exactly. So remember, when we did entropic regularization, it was kind of the opposite. Opposite. Everything wants to go everywhere when we're maximizing entropy. Uh, but that's not what actually happens in real life in, in unregularized transport problems. So if I take, say, here's my x1, x2, x3, and let's say they all have equal mass of a quarter. Okay, so mu i equals one quarter for all of these. And then somewhere close by, I have some y's. And, oops, and they are also all have equal mass. OK, so what's pi 1, 1 going to be in this? How much mass gets moved from here to here? A fourth, exactly. Everything that's sitting here is going to move here, right? There's, we're going to increase the cost by asking some of it to, to go farther. If we, can, if we can let it stay put, basically, then let's let it stay put. So a one quarter unit of mass is going to go here. Similarly, from here to here, a quarter unit of mass so this is pi 2, 2, which is pi 3, 3, which is pi 4, 4. Uh, how much mass is going to go from here to here? Zero. Nothing is going to go from there to there. So pi ij is equal to zero whenever i is not equal to j in this, in this simple example. So unlike in the entropically regularized uh, problems, mass doesn't want to spread out everywhere. It wants to go as few places as possible. It may have to split up to multiple places sometimes. You know, We don't have to have the same number of sources and targets here. So splitting can certainly happen. But we don't expect everything from one mass, something from one mass to get split into everything else. We'll get to go to one place or a couple places. And the vast majority of the time, these are going to be zero. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, one way to say that mathematically, I guess, is pi is sparse. It has a lot of zeros. Right? If, say, we have to solve it in this box over all values of x and y, OK, well, on some of these values of x and y, this discrete problem, it's going to be non-zero. But everywhere else, it's going to be zero. The, the mass is concentrated along basically a lower dimensional set. So what does that mean? OK, in principle, we have m times n unknowns. But in practice, only order n of them are actually non-zero. Most of these are zero. We know ahead of time most of them are going to be zero. 
We just don't know which ones are going to be zero ahead of time. But, uh, but this was the important observation. <clears throat> So uh, pi is uh, non-zero only for a order n points. So effectively, we really have only order n unknowns that we need to solve for, except we have to also figure out kind of the address of the unknowns. Um, you don't need to really assume much to be able to say that. Uh, now, if you want, with the algorithms, if you want to make them very rigorous uh, and, and be able to verify in an efficient way whether this is working, then assumptions about the C matrix certainly come into that. Um, but no, you wouldn't in general uh, really expect mass to be transported everywhere. I mean, unless you have some sort of, you know, constant cost where it costs the same to go, you know, it costs one dollar to go from here to anywhere, right? Then you can transport anywhere, and it doesn't matter. And all transport plans are optimal, and you can do whatever you want. So, the big problem here is that we just we don't know a priori, uh, which components are non-zero. <coughs> okay, so this is the big idea, though. Again, this was uh, proposed twice a few years ago. Basically the same idea, they did it a little bit differently. Uh, so this was uh, once by Adam Oberman and once by Bernard Schmitzer. It's like the same year, I think. Um, so the idea was let's somehow find a small neighborhood of, uh, let's call this neighborhood N, uh, that contains the support of pi. Okay, so, you know, pi is in principle defined on this x cross y space, right? It's non-zero on, you know, effectively a curve through this space or, you know, something that's effectively lower dimensional. We're going to try to find a little neighborhood of this. So in this little neighborhood is, is going to be n. This dark line is the support of pi. And we're going to try to solve the optimal transport problem under the assumption that pi is zero outside of this neighborhood, right? So those aren't unknowns. We don't have to solve for them. And our linear program shrinks dramatically. Okay, so this is what we want to solve. So the minimum. We're trying to minimize. Okay, again, we want to add up CIJ, pi IJs. But now we're not going to add this up over all the I's and J's because we know that a lot of them are going to give us no contribution whatsoever. We're going to go add it up over the I's and J's that belong to this small neighborhood. 
okay? Subject to our conditions. So again, we need the right marginals. So we're going to add up pi i j from 1 to n. But some of them we're not going to waste our time adding because they're 0. So we're only going to do this if i and j belong to our small neighborhood. Similarly for the other marginal. Okay, and we're going to require pi ij greater than or equal to zero. But again, we only have to force the, enforce this in our small neighborhood. Okay, let's call this problem Kn. This is, this is a more tractable problem. Whether it gives us the right answer or not, you know, it depends if we've actually got a reasonable neighborhood here. Um, but it's certainly a more tractable problem to solve. Uh, what do we have? If if this neighborhood is essentially just a few points across, then we really only have order n or order m unknowns to solve for. Um, so order n inequality constraints, we have still m plus n inequality constraints. Um, but again, we're going to only be adding up you know, a much smaller number of things, because a lot of things get excluded from this sum. So this, this, is, a, this is a nice problem to solve. Now the question is, how do we decide on this neighborhood? OK, so probably we're going to decide on it uh, in multiple steps. So we come up with a crude guess. And we try to refine it a little bit. Uh, and in particular, a good way to do this can be a multi-level approach. So this is sort of the second big idea. We can use a multi-scale approach. Uh, sure, it will depend on how you. So it, de it depends if you're thinking of this as a discretization of a continuous problem or if this was a discrete problem to start with. Uh, but, um, but if I assume that you know, this is x1, x2, x. So this, uh, this is a 1D picture, first of all. Uh, so certainly in, in, in two dimensions, this would be like a four dimensional box. So in 1D, if I put these things in order, you get something like this, a curve through here. Um, in higher dimensions, you're going to get some kind of surface through there. Uh, and the fact that it looks like a nice diagonal, sure, depends on the cost function, how I've labeled things, absolutely. Uh, I'm assuming these live in, some, you know, in Rn somewhere, right? So there's, there's a sense of what's closer to what. Uh, no, it won't necessarily be around the diagonal. It could be somewhere else. I just I drew it that way, but yeah, we cannot assume ahead of time that it's gonna that we can just sort of say here's the diagonal. Let's look around the diagonal, and we're good. That that would be a dumb assumption to make. You know, it would get us into trouble. So in a multi-scale approach, what would you do? You would start by, by batching these a little bit. So we have lots, of, lots and lots and lots of drafts. And we don't want to deal with all of them at once because it's, it's too expensive. So maybe we're happy to deal with two of them. So you know, we take 
all of these, and we say, oh, let's just kind of concentrate this in two masses that are approximated somehow. What's that? So you have to prove the which? The optimality. Yeah, did we do? Yeah, so I'm not exactly picking two points here. It's probably a little bit different. Um, what I'm doing is basically taking all the mass that's in here and saying, let's concentrate it in here. Right? And take all the mass in here and let's concentrate it in here. They might not be equal in masses, right? So if this, is, if this is my x space, this is going to be, say, my x, let's call it x2, x, where I approximate it with two masses. <coughs> and I do the same thing for my y space. So I take my y space, which has lots of little masses in it, whatever, and say, maybe these are the right places to OK, if I only have two mass source masses and two target masses, I'll solve the whole optimal transport problem, right? It doesn't take any time to do that. So we can go ahead and solve the full problem. So the full Kantorovich problem uh, between x and y. Okay, so I have x and I have y, <coughs> and I've decided that maybe these are, these are the kind of non-zero components. Oh, maybe there might be something else. So maybe this value of x goes to this value of y, but there's some mass left over, and so maybe a little bit goes up here too. Right, so it could be that this transports as much mass as it can to here. There's some left over because they're not necessarily all equal mass anymore. So it transports the rest of its mass over here, and this transports all its mass over here. And, and your pi would be something like this, right? These three values of pi would be, would be non-zero, and this would be zero. And then you say, OK, in x and y space, where's the support of this? Let's try to sort of draw a neighborhood of the support of this. And it looks something like this. OK, so now, so now this set in my x and y space is going to be my estimate of n. So I'm going to say this is my first guess at n. OK, that's kind of a crude guess. Um, I, I still don't really want to solve my my full optimal transport problem with all my masses in that big of a neighborhood. It's kind of big. Um, but we can do this again. We could say, okay, let's take all these masses. We have a lot of them. And instead of two, maybe I'll batch them in four groups this time. Right? And similarly for my y's. And now I say, I'm going to solve not the full Kantorovich problem. Four masses isn't bad, right? But I don't have to solve the full problem. I'm going to just solve it in this neighborhood and assume pi is zero everywhere else. So let's solve this problem between x4 and y4. Well, now I'm going to get a more refined picture here, right? In the, in the first round, this mass some of this mass was allowed to jump all the way over here. In this next round, that's not going to happen because there's going to be intermediate states, right? So, okay, maybe some of it goes here and there's leftover. 
So the rest of it goes a little farther to the right, but doesn't have to jump all the way over because there's intermediate places it can go. So again, I'm going to get something that says, OK, here's maybe my four basic parts, and maybe a little of this mass went here, and maybe a little of this mass went, also went here. And again, I can say, oh, I kind of have an estimate of the support, something like this. And I can start to shrink this neighborhood. So this becomes an updated neighborhood. And you keep going, right? We keep refining the problem. Now we don't do four masses. Now we do eight in this neighborhood. We get a more refined picture of the support of pi. And that means we can start to shrink this neighborhood down. So if we keep going, eventually we get back to our full problem. So maybe once we solved at the n over 2 level, we solved it in some neighborhood. and. Now we're starting to get something that's looking much more refined. Right? I have a much better picture of what the support of pi really looks like. So again, now I can take a much narrower neighborhood and say, so this is my updated n. And now let's solve the full problem on this relatively narrow. So let's solve. K n from the full problem, but now in this narrow band. Yes. Um. So a multi-level thing like this, you typically keep doubling and keep doubling. Um, and solving this at the n over 2 level is, is generally cheap compared to solving it at the n level. So it's, it's worth it to keep going and do all these levels, usually. Is it normally, at the very least, you go to n over 2 level? Right? T t typically, yeah. Okay. yeah. In, so in multi-level schemes, multi-grid type methods, um, you know, as you're, as you're dividing out factor of 2 each that time, there's not that many levels that you have to actually go through. right? It doesn't take very many levels to go from 2 to a pretty big number. Uh, and, and doing it on these coarser levels, you, know, you, you, try to, you try to do as much of the work as you can where it's cheap to do it, and then get more refined information uh, where you have to do a little more work. But, but sort of don't try to get the coarse information where, where it requires a lot of work. Yeah, so that, how do you pick the initial points? How do you decide how much mass to assign to them? Uh, so it's probably delicate, and it's going to be a little bit problem dependent. There's a couple things that could happen. You might have started with a continuous problem, and you're trying to approximate it with Dirac's. Oh. So you might just do something like this. This would be maybe an easy way to do it, is to say, this is maybe I'm in two dimensions. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of masses, wherever they are. So I might say, let's just do this and add up how much mass is in each box. Uh, and then place, say, a Dirac at the center of mass in each box. That would be one uh, kind of quick and dirty way to do it. Is the, is the narrow band somehow sensitive to how you start your process? Is the narrow band somehow sensitive to how you start your process? I mean, if you do something ridiculous, then uh, probably. Um, but so, you know, this is, this is a kind of a heuristic argument that I just made. I didn't prove that it works, right? I said, this looks reasonable. Um, but but this, is, this is the next important question. Does this actually work? I'm not going to go into all the full details of, of how to make this work. It's a bit cost dependent. So it'll depend, I think you asked before, uh, what are the conditions on your C matrix? <coughs> But I want to talk a little bit about how do we decide if this actually did the right thing or not. Uh, 
Um, and one thing that you might do just along the way is if you know you solve on the neighborhood and then you find that actually you're getting support really on the boundary of this neighborhood when you solve you might say uh that might not have been good enough it feels like the mass is trying to wander this direction i should probably uh, update my neighborhood ex expand it out in this direction a little bit so you can you can put steps like that as kind of an interim again which is heuristic but but it gives you the feeling that things are going in the right direction. But how do you really check that this is right? OK, so at the end of the day, we get an estimate for our neighborhood. Uh, what did I call it? N for the full problem. And we compute pi n for the full problem. Now, if, <clears throat> if we happen to know that the support of pi so pi being the solution to the full optimal transport problem is contained in n, right? Then this problem is equivalent to our original problem. So if this is true, then pi n really is the thing we want, right? Thus the assumption that pi is 0 everywhere else outside this neighborhood is, is valid. But how can we be sure this works? OK, so let's do uh, an example that we're more familiar with. <coughs> so somehow we come up with a solution to this problem on some neighborhood. And when we solve pi n, we get something like this. This is the solution of pi n. And now we want to know, but is this really optimal? Does this really solve the full problem? OK, I'll, I'll do this in maybe a couple phases. Uh, suppose we also have an optimal map for this solution. Right? We, know we, we know there's not always a, an optimal map because mass can get split. Uh, but let's start by assuming there's an optimal map, and then we can relax that a little bit. So let's suppose also uh, there exists an optimal map T. Or, yeah, let's say that. How can, I, how can I read the map out of this information? Is it, is it encoded in here somewhere? So how do I find, let's call it Tn given pi n? Remember when I discretized this, this is my x space. This is my y space. This is the 1D picture, but of course you can do this in higher D. Let's say I take this, a point at this position in my x space. Um, did it get mapped to here? No, why not? Where does it get mapped to? It gets mapped right to here, to this dot. It gets mapped, you know, the map we can extract from the support of pi. So we're going to say that t of uh, x is equal to y if this point x and y 
belongs to the support, I'm just going to call this n, belongs to the support of pi. Right, so the support of pi is what tells us the map. Pi itself, you know, it has different values, so it will tell us exactly how much mass is being moved. And it could be, in general, this, there's a splitting. But it's the support of pi that encodes the map. And, and, and that's kind of reasonable, right? We said the support is this lower dimensional object. The map is also a lower dimensional object, right? It's a, the map itself is a function only of x, not of this whole cross product space. So we can get a map up here. OK, so we solve that. We want to know if it's optimal. We extract a map from it. Can I look at this map and decide if this is an optimal map? You're nodding. How can I decide that? There are optimality conditions, right? We already know we, already know we have the feasibility condition um, because we, we forced it here, right? Pi n has the correct marginals, right? We've set pi n to be 0 outside this neighborhood. So pi certainly has the correct marginals. So all we need to check is optimality. What's the optimality condition for this map? Gradient of a convex function. OK, sure. Well, let's check. Is Tn a gradient of a convex function? If, if it is, it's optimal, right? We know it's feasible. If it satisfies the optimality condition, then we're done, right? We didn't have to, we didn't have to somehow look at all these values that are 0 and compare them to different other things on this huge problem. We really could look at this lower dimensional object to decide if things are optimal. So if yes, it's optimal and our neighborhood worked. <clears throat> OK, so a little bit more generally, say I'm doing discrete optimal transport. Uh, I may not be able to write this t as a, as a gradient. Uh, how can I decide if this is optimal? What's my optimality condition in, in ge more generally? So you want to compare it to every other plan. <coughs> that, will, that will work, but it might be time consuming. So remember, we had this cyclical monotonicity condition that without this having to be, have any kind of smoothness embedded in it, we can check cyclical monotonicity. So more generally, we can check if t is cyclically monotone. Right? In other words, for all choices of, of x, right, if we dot this with the difference in the maps uh, and move around cyclically, minus t of xk, then this should have a sign. And this is at least a local condition that only requires information along here. Um, you know, there's still, there might be a lot of things to check here, so you need to come up with some, some shortcuts for how to check this in an efficient way, and there are some shortcuts. Um, that was if I assumed that I actually have a map. We can also, in general, right, we know, in general we know we might not have a map, that mass can get split. We can also talk about a cyclically monotone transport plan. So even more generally, we can say, is pi a 
cyclically monotone plan. So now we're going to do basically the same thing we did here. Remember T, we define as being, well, x, y belongs to the support of pi. Now T could have more than one different value. So we're going to do this now for x's and here y's where the x and y belong to the support of pi. Okay, so we're going to say for all, uh, let's say x1, y1 down to xn, yn that belong to the support of pi. So anything, anything that lives on, on this transport plan. <coughs> we want, and now exactly this same inequality to hold. So this is really a local condition uh, that guarantees global optimality. Right, so in other words, we guess at our neighborhood, we solve the problem on this small neighborhood, and now we say, I hope it's right, let's try to check. And now we need some local conditions, we check these local conditions, and that will either say, yes, good job, you came up with a good neighborhood, this is optimal, or it would say, uh, better try again, and then we need to know that we need to maybe enlarge this neighborhood, or shift this neighborhood, or do something. Yeah, that could happen. If it's not a map, uh, the same x could be repeated multiple times with different y's, exactly. Um, so this, th there's no assumption of order going on here. It's just saying, pick any pairs you like from here. So I could have said, this is my x1, y1, and this is my x2, y2, and this is my x3, y3, and this is my x4, y4. It doesn't matter. There's no assumption about order. Um, this was quadratic cost. You can do this for non-quadratic cost. So, <clears throat> you know, we generalized a lot of the quadratic cost things to, to a cost C, right? And we had all these ideas about C sub differentials, um, C convexity, and, and similarly, there's a concept of C cyclical monotonicity. So. So for other costs. We require C cyclical monotonicity. Okay, and that this condition is that we compare the cost function. Um, so these these being dotted together come from looking at quadratic cost things, right? Where we square them. And some of the terms cancel, and we just have the sort of dot product terms left over. Okay. But more generally, you could write down, you could do this in terms of you know, xk minus yk squared. Uh, and we compare this to what happens if we permute the y's a little bit. And again, quadratic cost. Uh, you're going to come right back to this condition. It's exactly equivalent, right? You'll get, when you multiply it out, you'll get xk squareds here, add them all up. You'll get xk squareds here, you add them all up. They're not important. You'll get all the yk squareds here, all the yk squareds here in a different order, but they're all there. They cancel out, and then all you're left with is the x dot y's here and the x dot yk plus 1's here, uh, and that's exactly this. 
So it's the same condition for quadratic cost. This is just a generalization. And again, this would be for all choices of pairings that live in the support of pi. Well, so what I'm not going to go into really detail on, but I will refer you to the paper, is uh, for specific costs, we want to build cheap ways of verifying these conditions. Okay, this is in the Schmitzer paper, which is on Canvas. Uh, and what he basically does is he finds ways of verifying that neighbors are good enough so that if you're optimal there, you're optimal everywhere. Now, he creates these shortcuts that says, well, kind of if we check for a few points, it's, it's going to guarantee that it works for everything else, more or less. Uh, and it, will take, it would take me out quite a bit of time to, ex more time than I want to spend explaining exactly how he does it. It's not that complicated. It's just a bunch of inequalities that you have to, to check in theory, uh, and, and it kind of works out. But you can check the paper, um, and there's some nice computations there. It works well. Uh, Adam Overman's paper has some nice computations that look like it works well. So, so this is a, a reasonable method, I think, for, for these big discrete problems. We're making them look a lot cheaper. Questions? Okay, so from here, I think next time we're going to go on to set the semi-discrete problem, so Dirac's to something with a density. Uh, but I'll leave you there today.